Good morning. This is the Blaine's World webcast that we found each week on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. You can also listen in on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and get more information about past shows and future shows at my website, which is behind me, plainsworld.net. I'm your host, Blaine Greenfield, and I'm here in my Zoom studio in lovely downtown Fairview, North Carolina. Each week, we focus on positive news and information about people and organizations in both Western North Carolina and throughout the country. And to then, and it's my pleasure to introduce John Hornsby. And John, before you go any further, you can wave to all your fans and friends who are watching this. <laughs> okay, and that's John. And John is founder of Hornsby Creative and president of AIGA, A, A, AIGA Asheville. He has over 25 years of experience. As I asked you uh, off the air, you saw this when you were, what, seven? You were the first? Yeah, about six and a half. Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I'm impressed. A brand strategy and experience design. John crafts compelling business branding experiences that inspire and captivate. His strategy first approach empowers leaders to seize opportunities and growth efficiently by attracting and resonating authentic authentic um, messages to audiences. I'm having trouble with voice today, John. He uh, okay. has passion for the creative um, community and the natural beauty of the application fuels his creativity outside the studio. And so the question I asked John the first time I met somebody on the air is, uh, as a kid, you grew up where? As a kid, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. As a kid growing up in Baltimore, Maryland, did you always know you wanted to be this uh, branding expert? No, I wanted to be an artist. <laughs> an artist. As, as a kid. And so um, when did you start uh, wanting to be an artist very young or uh very young yeah i pretty much as long as i can remember you know uh, from when i could hold a crayon i was always really interested in in drawing and and then later uh, you know other forms of art as well but it was a, a a creative outlet and sort of natural talent that i had that i was into from an early age did you study uh, art in school uh, I did. I did. Um, as a child, I had um, some private art lessons throughout, um, like elementary uh, or middle high school. Um, I went the high school that I went to um, is called Baltimore Lutheran High School. Had a great um, art teacher there. Her name was Jackie Seaborn. Um, sadly, she passed uh, last year or so, but um, she was a big influence on my development um, and encouraging me to, you know, pursue creative work and art so after you then stopped being a student with her uh where'd you go from there yeah so i actually um did not go to college i don't have a degree in anything other than school of hard knocks <laughs> um i ended up uh going to work for a special events company um and uh, in the art department there they did like themed uh events um so it was very similar to theater work um, and that we were creating props and sets to go in to transform, you know, the Hilton ballroom into a different environment for a themed party. Um, so lots of painting, making all different types of things, uh, setting it up, breaking it down, packing trucks, uh, crazy hours. Um, so that was kind of how I found um, a, a way to sort of get paid <laughs> to do creative work as my first creative job. So went from there then into helping with these special events, which is kind of cool, to then um, moving from there to where you are now. Is that what happened? Well, uh, from the, I worked there for about seven years or so. Um, I ended up becoming the director of the art department for a little while. Um, I left uh, my first attempt at entrepreneurship, which um, failed horribly. I went out on my own um, and started uh, my own sort of design business, um, but I didn't know anything about business <laughs> at that time or how to get customers or anything like that. I just knew I was creative and wanted to do that work. Um, that ended up not panning out. I came back to that company um, and ran their graphic design department for a, a little while before transitioning to the sign industry. And then I worked at different sign companies um, for about 20 years, um, doing everything from production work to design work, and then eventually getting it, uh, doing team management and uh, project management, sales, sales team management, 
eventually pretty much everything but owning the the sign shop or doing the accounting um and it was after doing that during that time we moved from baltimore to, to Asheville about 11 years ago and um about six years ago or so i uh, kind of went back out on my own again um with hornsby creative and that's kind of leads up to about where we are now and that's pretty cool that you actually had done this and didn't succeed but mm -hmm. then decided to get what made you decide to get back into it again running your own company uh, it was a combination of things. Uh, one, at a certain point, um, you know, I felt like there wasn't anywhere else I could go um, within the the, the companies uh, that, that I was at. So I, I worked um, at Fast Signs, actually, when I moved to Asheville, I worked there for about six years or so. Um, and it was it was great. And on paper, everything was good. I got paid well, uh, you know, had sort of a leadership position in the company um, but at a certain point, I, I felt like I couldn't continue to grow beyond where I was at um, staying there. Um, so I decided to jump off the cliff and try my hand at kind of doing things the way that I wanted to do them um, and do more of the work that I wanted to do. Um, and, uh, and, and that sort of led to kind of going back out again. And what did you do differently than the second time around? that you weren't going through the first time? Yeah, well, I mean, the first time was like 20 years ago or something. So um, I, um, A, I had a network already established because I was had been doing sales um, and customer service for in, in this area um, for years. I had, had contacts. <laughs> um, and I had been doing sales up in Maryland too at the sign company I was at there before I moved. Um, and I had gotten that in that job, uh, the owner had encouraged me to go out and join networking groups and that sort of thing. So I had started to understand about, you know, it's all about like who you know and, and building a network and helping people and uh, learning how to, you know, stand up in front of people and talk about what you do. and. Um, and all those types of skills that come sales skills, basically that I did not have at all, uh, um, you know, 20 years ago when I first tried to go out on my own. So also then you started, uh, Hornsby creative <clears throat> and, um, what's the story behind then Hornsby creative? What, what do you do actually at Hornsby creative? So at Hornsby Creative, I like to say that we help empower organizational leaders to seize opportunities and grow efficiently uh, by using design. Um, and so we kind of have a holistic offering of we do discovery and strategy work to help our clients get really clear about who they are, uh, who they serve, their unique offer, um, how to ar authentically articulate um, what who they are and what they offer uh, to the right audience in a way that's going to resonate um, and attract that audience. And that informs also the design work that we do. So we do like brand identity design, which, you know, logos and, and, uh, and their, you know, what you say and how you say it and how you look and feel. And then um, we also, because of my background in production work and working at sign companies and large format printers and, um, promotional products and that sort of thing uh, often help people then take that and activate it into physical touch points as well, whether it's signage for their brick and mortar business um, or if it's, you know, uh, apparel and giveaways and those sort of things, uh, we're set up to uh, be able to supply that as well. Talk about the process in that <clears throat> in on paper, it looks like it's great and everybody should be doing it. But the reality is a lot of people don't do it or don't do it very well. I guess part of the problem is they don't think too much about branding or they just kind of, I guess, start a business and then hope it comes to them. Is that what typically happens or often happens? Well, I think a lot of things happen. Um, uh, very common is someone to start a business be like, okay, I need a, <laughs> I'm starting a business. I need a logo. All right. Um, and that is true. Uh, generally, you're going to want to have a logo. Um, but, uh, branding is, is much more than just a logo. Um, it's, it's, 
how you look and feel. It's what, how people feel about you. Um, and so there's a lot more that goes into it. And then um, a lot of times what happens when people first start out too, is they're very uh, focused on themselves and, uh, uh, and what it is they offer. But uh, our, our clients, whatever your business is, doesn't really care that much about you or your logo. They care, are you the solution to their problem or not? And um, so really help people to kind of get clear on who they are, but also get clear on their audience and what their needs are and what they're looking for and then how to communicate um, that um, not so much about, hey, look at me, but here's how you know we help solve the problem that you have and getting clear on who that is so you're not wasting your time trying to sell your services to people who are not even your customers. I tell folks, um, John, that people uh, should keep in mind uh, the most popular radio station in the Asheville area, and that's uh, WIIFM, you know, and so the whole idea of uh, what's in it for me, you know, that, ah. <laughs> that you, your point's well taken, that people think about themselves, but nobody really cares about themselves. It's what your clients are all about. And um, it's hard to find that out, that I guess that's where you come into play. You'll sit down with a client and then help them discover, I guess, the message they want to get across to their clients. Is that what happens? Yeah, usually the clients that um, that I work with in that capacity are businesses or organizations that have um, are probably usually not just starting. Uh, usually they they've <clears throat> been at it for a while. They're doing okay, but whatever they did to get started versus what they are now, you know, five, six, ten years after they started their business, um, they've evolved and they've gotten more clarity about who they are and who they serve. And um, maybe they did just get started and just, you know, hey, I just need a logo. And they did something and they ran with that and uh, they were successful. Um, but now they realize that there's a gap between how they're perceived and what they're really delivering and the client, they've gotten more clarity about, you know what, these are the, when we started, we thought we were going to do this, but we really do this. And we thought we were serving this customer, but we really serve this customer. But our branding is still kind of communicating what we thought we were and who we thought we were serving and not um, what our refined offer is now and what not what our ideal client is now. So usually there's some sort of growth inflection point and that's where we sort of come in and, um, you know, as businesses, you just tend to organically gather lots of things and accumulate lots of stuff, you know, from a branding perspective or operations or all the things. Um, and so we kind of help sift through it and, and clarify, okay, what here is really important? What here is really true? What should we maybe get rid of? Um, and then we also do a little bit of research, looking at the clients in the market um, to help determine, you know, okay, you know, your customers, uh, they also like these things, you know, these are things that are the values, these are the things they think are important, these are the things they're interested in, and, and then looking at that internally as well, and then sort of taking both those things, you sort of think of like a Venn diagram, and once we get clear on, on you and clear on who you serve, where those overlap, that's kind of the sweet spot that we want to kind of focus in on and build branding and, and messaging and visuals around. It would seem helpful, even though you said that a lot of people don't work with you initially at startup, but it would really be helpful, I guess, if somebody did come with you at startup. Do you ever work with firms that are just starting and getting off the ground with the proper branding message? Sometimes, yeah. Um, it's um, there's, a, there's a budget piece there that's part of that. Um, uh, factor too. So a lot of times when people are just starting out, um, they may not be at a point where they're wanting to invest at the level that we typically charge for what we offer. Um, that's not always the case, um, but that is a part of the reason why I sort of focus on my ideal client, usually being someone that is is already successful and not necessarily in startup mode. I'm burning capital. I don't have any clients yet. Um, and that's that's a different set of stressors and uh, on the on the business. And honestly, at that stage, um, you probably should do 
whatever you need to do to get up and, and get going and, and start making sales, prove the concept of your business, um, and then, you know, sort of refine things. But I do also do, um, I do work with, with startups sometimes, uh, and new businesses, uh, sometimes, uh, I do also do some, a lot of educational, um, content as well, and, and also teach some classes and things, um, and offer, you know, sort of micro kind of strategy sessions and that sort of thing as well as sort of smaller engagements that, that sometimes are a better fit. And since you obviously know it, but a lot of your clients perhaps don't, if I can ask you or put you on the spot here, when you're talking about branding, what exactly is it? And if I can have you keep this under two and a half hours, you know, we'll just uh, <laughs> not do the whole course, but what exactly yeah. is branding? Uh, in a nutshell, branding is what people think about you and feel about you when you, you leave the room. It's, it's paraphrasing a quote of another branding expert. It's a great line, but, though. Yeah. Uh, so basically, you know, and then we can influence that. You can't control it, right? So like right now, we've only just met. Like, you know, we don't really know each other. So, you know, and, and, and of course, I've... I, did, I've done some research. I've seen your podcast. I pro know a little bit more um, for having done that. But um, right now, in my head, um, your brand is is um, there's not as much to it as say for comparison. And the same would be true for me in your head as if we say like Coca Cola, right? So like we've grown up with Coca Cola. <laughs> They've been around forever. They're like this big legacy brand, and everyone. Uh, they're big enough that like everyone has a sense of what Coca-Cola is and means and how it feels and how it tastes and all these things associated with it. And that's all part of the, the brand. Um, Coca-Cola cannot completely control um, how their brand exists in my brain, but they do influence it by doing ads on the Super Bowl and by ads on buildings uh, throughout, you know, past hundred years. Um, and all this advertising, um, and that influences how I think and feel about Coca-Cola. And the same is true of, of any business or even people. You know, there's the concept of personal brands now is something that people talk about a lot more, um, which is, you know, just what do people think of me as a person? Um, and that's going to, that, how I dress is one factor of that. That's sort of the visual branding, Right. Um, but also what I say and how I say it. Um, am I am I nice to people? Am I a jerk? Like all these things affect um, the brand. So um, we make decisions uh, with businesses and a logo. What I'm wearing is part of that. Um, the website, you know, that's part of your presentation. But there's visuals, there's language, um, what you say and how you say it. And how things look and feel are all parts of how we kind of influence branding in people's minds. You raised a you raised a good point uh, with the Coca Cola example. And so I'll ask you if somebody in Asheville, for example, wants to build brand, brand awareness from start. You know, so somebody comes to Asheville, never been to the area before, and they all of a sudden want their brand to get out there. How long does that take? And kind of before how long it takes. What's the first thing you should be doing if you're trying to build brand awareness? Mm. Well, how long does it take is an interesting question. Uh, I don't know if that's easy to answer. Um, I would say for a, a lot of, in just very general terms, um, you know, I would say you, you shouldn't expect a whole lot under six months um, in terms of, and that's um, presuming, you know, again, that you're, putting stuff out there. Um, and so as far as what you should do first, it kind of depends on your business, the nature of your business and who you serve. So getting some clarity. And again, when you're first starting out, um, there's a lot of guesswork involved and uh, it's a dirty secret in marketing that there's a lot of guesswork involved <laughs> always, right? <laughs> Otherwise everyone would always be successful um, because nothing is, everything's always changing and evolving and, you know, you can't step in the same river twice sort of idea, you know, what worked yesterday for a certain company and business and a certain context 
may not work tomorrow um, for a different business or different context. And it may not work tomorrow for the same business, <laughs> the same thing that worked yesterday because stuff happens. Um, but getting clear on, on that, getting clear on, on who you serve, how to make a simple um, offer in a way that is easily understood. You know, we, we all also have a tendency to overcomplicate, I think. Um, and it's, you know, could a seventh grader sort of understand what it is that you do <laughs> when you talk about it? Um, and where are those people? Um, you know, if your ideal audience is, you know, the diehard fans of Blaine's World podcast, then probably the first thing you should do is go on Blaine's World. But if you're, you know, your ideal audience is, um, you know, avid readers of WNC Business Magazine, then maybe you should put an ad in there. Um, so it's sort of identifying for your industry and your audience um, where to be and then, you know, how to show up in that space. By the way, you gave me, and, and thank you for this, one of the great things to think about when you're developing branding or trying to get your word out, and that is if it can't be understood by a seventh grader, mm -hmm. maybe it's a little too complex, you know, mm -hmm. because you probably see this all the time, I do as well, you hear people talk about concepts and I can't even follow it, you know, so if I can't follow it, you know, nobody's going to be able to follow it. And it's like, I don't know, one of the things I, I do, I, I do some, um, my background is in marketing as well. And um, mm. I do a lot of work um, for uh, AB Tech and some of their, you know, some of the uh, fir firms. And you want people to be able to explain their business. And I tell people, uh, I'll start off, John, 100 words, great. Then cut it down to 50. Then cut right. it down to 25. Then 10. If you can't explain it in a short period of time, I guess you have a problem. Do you find that with some of your clients that they have trouble explaining what their business is? Yeah, m most. And I think it's, <laughs> I think everyone struggles with this. I struggle with it too. Um, and that's where having like an outside point of view, um, you know, it's hard to see the label from inside the bottle as well. So like it, in my mind, um, you know, it's very clear what I do because it's, it's in my head and I'm the one doing it. And so business owners, it can be very clear to them, um, but they might not be able to clearly articulate it in a way that is easily understood by someone who's not in their head, which is everyone else. <laughs> Where does research come into play? Uh, research comes into play. So when we do discovery process, we start with, uh, mission, vision, values type of, um, module then we do sort of internal assessment um then we do a uh, client assessment and then we do market uh, assessment so research for us comes into play more in the market assessment side of things um when we're doing uh, strategy work um so then we're kind of going out and looking at you know okay who's who's the competition who's um, sort of more like aspirational brands that you you like things about them that you want to aspire to be more like um, who's the audience and then doing some research on, okay, what are they doing? Right. Where do they, where do, you know, what do they care about these sorts of things um, and putting all that together on the design side, research comes into play too, just um, for like inspirational things. And then again, depending you know, every business has things that are uh, learning opportunities, you know, so there may be research in just in, in like, oh, in this particular industry, you need to understand a little more about how this part of that works. Um, so we're going to, you know, go down the rabbit hole a little bit and just learn a little bit more about that and see what emerges that might be um, informative or inspirational from a creative design standpoint. When people come to see you, uh, do you encourage them to show you what they like, for example, about the competition? Is that helpful part of the process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, as we, um, you know, have sort of our intro questionnaire and follow up conversations. Part of what we talk about is um, a what do they like um, in general, because that is a factor, although it's not the only factor. Um, and what's more important, you know, what your ideal clients like. But like I was going back to that sort of Venn diagram idea, it has to also be authentic to you. So, I mean, even if my ideal clients love, uh, 
rubber ducks, but I just hate <laughs> rubber ducks. So then we're probably going to try and find something else to coalesce around that we have in common. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like I lost my train of thought for a second. But No, you're just talking about you know, where you get ideas from a little bit. And it's um, um, funny that sometimes I tell folks, uh, John, to not only look at your competition, but sometimes it's fun to look at something completely different. You know, because yes, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I tell people, if you want to have your advertising, your branding look like everybody else, you can do that. But sometimes it's kind of fun. And I, I'll sometimes do this, look completely unrelated field, you know, and mm -hmm. see what they do. And they might be a little bit unique or different than anybody else. You know, so um, I guess one of the tough things in, in your business is to get away from that idea that you want everybody, I guess everybody comes to you and they want their brand to be unique or different and unlike anybody else's, you know, they don't want to spend any money, but they just want to have, you know, we want to have this unique brand that'll make us stand out from everybody else in the, in the city, but it's easier said than done, you know, um, you know, yeah, don't put a mountain on it. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to stand out in Nashville. <laughs> it's, just, it's just funny. It's just before you, I interviewed a, a very talented photographer and he was showing me his pictures, but yeah, there were a lot of mountains, you know, right. so. Uh, Which, understandably, but, right. But, but that's a really good point. Because yeah, when I first came to Asheville like 20 years ago, it was 20 years ago, or not quite 20, maybe 15, but a lot of people, as you said, would just put mountains in there, either their brands or their pictures or their their names, you know, and, and that's, was okay maybe then, but now a lot of people have stolen that idea, you know, so, you know, how do you come right. up with something that doesn't use the mountain, you know? Um, where do you tell people to get ideas from? In other words, they come to you and you're the idea man, they want you to help them, but on their own, where should they get ideas from for branding? Well, I, uh, I really like your point, Blaine, about, um, finding inspiration from different things too, because that is a good way to sort of stand out. You know, if you're, um, you know, a therapist and you're just looking at all the other therapists, you know, there, everyone does sort of like consciously or unconsciously <laughs> sort of fall into these trend following things. Right. Um, and so, yeah, looking at, um, and we do do that with the clients with sort of, what we call paragons, which is like the aspirational sort of brands that start out with something that's similar, um, but then something that's maybe related. So like, for example, um, we're working with like a uh, um, HVAC company, uh, just say that because we've just been doing one, um, you know, so like similar, the obvious is like other HVAC companies. So what are, what are they doing? But then it's like, okay, well, what are like industries that service HVAC companies, like the equipment suppliers and so forth? What are they doing? And and then what's something that's like even more distant? Like maybe it's Apple or Coca Cola or um, or a therapist, right? And and, um, and what is it that we like you like about that? What's a quality that you want to emulate and bring in that comes from a less obvious place? but still, you know, makes sense somehow. Um, and so where different disciplines, sort of things that seem like they're not related, when you kind of smash them together, um, what what comes out of that is a, is a good creative exercise. Well, a uh, creative exercise, very similar, what I used to have clients do, is take a look at the yellow pages. Remember when they used to have something called yellow pages? Yeah, well, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what your point was so spot on because yeah, what too many people would do is just look at dentists, for example, and every dentist ad looked exactly the same, you know, so you yeah. have five pages of dentist ads. Brush, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. But wouldn't it be kind of fun if you instead went to a plumber or some completely unrelated field and get some ideas. And then can you imagine that your yellow page ad, everyone looks the same, but yours looks a little bit different, you know, and mm -hmm. you, that's a good point. You don't have to use a toothbrush if you're a dentist to, um, you know, but that's what it's all about. Talk about another problem um, you probably deal with, John. And that's um, when folks come to you and they've been successful, relatively successful, but then all of a sudden they want to change their brand, you know, mm -hmm. and um, you oftentimes see that in politics, you know, that, that you have to change your brand. That's probably a kind of a challenge unto itself to get somebody to do they sometimes come to you and say 
they've used the brand for 20 years and not want to use it anymore. Does that happen? Yeah, re sort of rebranding is something that we work on a lot again because um you know, like I said, you know, a lot of times uh clients that we work with sort of did something to start out and then they've gotten further down the road, they've got more clarity, they've changed, you know, had to pivot on some things here and there. And um so essentially if the if there's a significant gap between how you are currently presenting and what that's attracting versus what you um, should be presenting and attracting, um, then that's when we might want to consider if it makes sense to rebrand. And then, um, you know, sort of step down version of that is sometimes called a brand refresh, which is sort of just kind of changing things up, not totally changing things, um, but just sort of updating things a, a little more, making tweaks. Um, so when you get into sort of rebranding, you can kind of either take sort of an evolutionary approach or a revolutionary approach, you know, so evolutionary would be, um, for example, just been doing some work with a uh, first choice service group, they're the HVAC and electrical company I mentioned. Um, and they, um, there are elements of the brand that, and they have brand recognition, they have loyal client base. So it made sense to do something evolutionary as opposed to doing something radically different, where then that might create confusion. And, you know, their existing uh, sort of brand equity that they've built up in people's minds of people recognizing who they are, you risk disrupting and losing that if you go too far and change things too much. So, you know, certain, uh, you know, their, their old logo had a shield in it. And so we sort of kept that the new logo also has a shield in it, similar colors, but we're adding some things, updating things, making it a little more modern looking, um, bringing in some, some other elements, but it's, uh, it would not be shocking to their existing client base to be like, oh, this is a new face, but I still know who this is. I still feel comfortable these are still the people I, I know, like, and trust as opposed to, um, and it's not that one is right or wrong. It's just a matter of what's the right choice for the situation, whether to do something evolutionary like that or something completely radically different. And I think I've seen it in the industry you're talking about when uh, several uh, air conditioning type folks all of a sudden add a line of generators, you know, so that the um, air conditioning, they built the business, air conditioning and heating, but all of a sudden they have this now, I guess, completely somewhat unrelated business. And so that would be an example of what an evolutionary that they grow and they're still doing the air conditioning and heating, but they also are involved in, in generators, you know, so that's, mm -hmm. and that that's the kind of thing that happens, I guess. Yeah. And that's kind of exactly part of what's gone on with this client that I mentioned. And, and so organically over time, like started out with the logo we got the name and like, oh, but now we do this. So let's just add that onto the logo. And now there's like, now it's kind of busy. It says a lot of things because it's like this and then, but add on this and that. And then at a certain point, you have to kind of tease that back apart and be like, okay, we have to simplify this back down. And um, it's not necessarily the job of the logo to illustrate and explain everything that your business does. <laughs> it's right. the job of your logo to be like simple, memorable, um, give some sort of idea of, of what you do, but that's where the rest of your branding comes into play. It's the job of the rest of your branding and marketing to tell the whole story. Uh, you know, the logo is like the, the book cover maybe, but some, a lot of times people try and put the whole chapters into the logo um, and that doesn't work well. A challenge for you, I would imagine working with a client is that if they have a point where they've had a logo for a lot of years, does this ever happen? And that maybe it's time to retire the logo or get a new logo or what you're using doesn't work 20 years later. Does that ever happen? Yeah, there is sort of like, you know, going back to sort of trends and so forth. Uh, some things tend to look dated at a certain point. You know, you can look at some things and be like, oh, that looks. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because there's sort of, some things are sort of classic can sort of have a classic timeless feel um, and be. Uh, you know, like Coca-Cola is a little bit of a weird example just because they're such a big, you know, 
iconic brand, but you know, they're, they're, it, it worked in the fifties, but it also works now. Right. It's not like it has some element that was like a trend um, at the time um, that is like, Oh, that feels like, like a lot of, it feels like ninth, early nineties or something. <laughs> right. Um, and, and so, and that's tricky to capture and it's kind of hard to really articulate and put your finger on, but I think it comes back to sort of back to fundamentals and simplicity and, you know, things that um, work well will work well in any time if they're base, if they're kind of simple and fundamental, as opposed to something that's like trying to take advantage of a, of a trend or something that's sort of more fleeting um that's clearly tied to a, a moment in time have you ever had to tell a client it's time to retire their logo or get a new logo does that ever happen or even if the logo they were using doesn't work you know it never worked from day one and they used it for 20 years does that ever happen sure uh yeah we have those conversations um <laughs> <laughs> regularly um and that can go different ways but um you know, the, usually sometimes people are attached to what they have and sometimes they're they're coming in, you know, wanting a, a change. Um, and so, again, if it just if it that kind of goes back to the importance of like a having a discovery process, because outside of that, it's just aesthetic opinions that aren't in any sort of context. So it's not really about like, do I think, do I like this or do you like this? Those are factors. I have a point of view, you have a point of view, but, you know, design, one of the things that makes design different from art uh, when it comes to design and branding is design is a, a goal driven, you know, art exists for its own sake and for its own aesthetic purpose. Um, but design is, is to achieve an outcome. And so, um, and it's a dirty secret of design too, that you could have bad branding. And if you're really good at business, then it may not matter. <laughs> uh, and conversely, you could have the, like the best, <laughs> nicely designed thing in the world. Uh, but if your business idea or model or acumen doesn't work, then that's not going to save you necessarily either. So obviously the ideal is like, you know, firing on all cylinders <laughs> uh, with both things. Um, so those are things that come into play. And you raised such a good example in the very beginning that you could have the greatest brand, you could have the greatest business, but if you're nasty to people, you know, or you, you, um, you know, or they don't like what you're wearing, whatever the case is, there are so many other factors come into play, you know, and so I guess branding is one of them, but it has to be integrated with everything else, you know, or you yeah. don't have problems. John, when should somebody decide it's an ideal time to contact um, John Hornsby with Hornsby Creative Group? Who who should be working with you in terms of their business? Yeah, so we tend to work with um, business owners. We tend to work with uh, marketing directors, executive directors. Um, and generally, um, the sort of common denominator is there's some sort of uh, growth inflection point where maybe your day-to-day -day resources are kind of tapped out, um, but you have this opportunity or challenge um, that you realize that you, you want to try and tackle as it relates to um, your, your branding, as it relates to your offer. So again, if you're uh, at that spot where you're like, you know, we, we did what we did and it got us successful to this point, but now we, we feel like we're a little bit stuck in terms of we're not quite attracting the right clients um, or it might be like hey we're opening up a new location and we need help because um, we're busy running our business and we need someone that can come in and help you know figure out how everything's going to look and our, our how to take our existing branded and apply it to uh, the space or event or something of that nature if folks want to get more information about hornsby um creative what's the best bet uh, so that would be hornsbycreativegroup.com is the website. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Those are the social platforms that we spend time on. And yeah. And so then what typically happens? They contact you and then you 
of initial consultation with them or what's the process? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so if you go to our website, you can schedule a, a free 30 minute consultation as sort of an entry point. So if you want to just hop on a quick call, pick my brain about whatever, um, see if we might be a good fit. Um, if not, I'm happy to help you know direct you to the solution to your problem if it's not me. And um, and then from there, we would um, look at, you know, a specific solution for your problem, um, put together, you know, how we might work together, budget and, and timelines and all that sort of thing. Okay. And again, once again, if you would give the, um, the website is a lot of good information there is what? Hornsby Creative Group dot com. And like, thank you, uh, John, for being my guest on this edition of the Blaine's World um, webcast. Most like thank my producer, Cappy Tassetti, and hopefully we'll someday actually meet in person. Thanks, man. Well, thank, thank you for having me. Okay, this was great.